Thank you, Alvin and uh, Big Five Plus for inviting me. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. I'm sure you know who he is. And I also know why you are here today, to learn some investment skill and expand your investment knowledge. There are a lot of books out there written about on uh, Warren Buffett, but there's none written by himself. I'm not here today to tell you how to be the next Warren Buffett. I'm here to share with you today three important um, value investing principles that we practice and you can learn and practice yourself as well. My name is Sai I'm the co-founder and fund manager of Aggregate Asset Management. As uh, Elvin already uh, described, we are a value, no management fee value manager in Singapore. What is value investing? You always hear about value investing. It's something about we want to buy a company's share at the share price substantially lower than its intrinsic value. And most of the time, I think you commonly heard about like price to book ratio, price to earning ratio, and things like that. What is our expectation if we practice value investing? A double digit return. Assuming if you have $1 million today to invest, what will happen if you can compound your investment at the rate of 5%, 10%, and 15%? What will happen after 15 years? You can see from the table that if you can only compound your $1 million, you only grow to $2 million at 15 year mark. Whereas if you can compound your investment at the rate of 15%, it can actually quadruple the $2 million, four times more than $2 million. It is a very big deal about double digit return. And no wonder why Albert Einstein called this uh, compounding interest the eighth wonder of the world. Who has achieved double digit return? Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing. Warren Buffett, he was inspired by him and learned under him. Walter Sloss, he is a Buffett colleague, he was Buffett colleague when both of them worked together with under Benjamin Graham. He started his investment journey at the age of 40 years old with no formal college education. He was able to compound investment at the rate of 16% for a total of 28 years, between 1956 to 1984. A $100,000 would grow to $6.5 million. At the same period of 28 years, Index only returned 8.4%. Charlie Munger, he is a Warren Buffett partner at Berkshire. He was able to compound the return of 13.7% between 1962 and 1975. For the same period of time, index only returned 5% per annum. Who is this young man in the photo? Anyone like to make a guess? Warren Buffett, when he was young, much handsome, right? And he was able to compound the return at almost 20% per annum for the last 50 years, between 1965 to 2015. $100,000 can grow to a whopping of $650 million. No wonder he's one of the richest men, right? For that 50 years period of time, the index only returned 9.7% per annum. People always tell us that investment is an art form. Do we have a more scientific way to look at investment that we can learn, we can apply instead of just pure art form? Let's find out. This is a study uh, prepared by Professor E. Borson. He took all the stocks on New York Stock Exchange, and he ranked all the stock based on price to book ratio, and he put them into 10 baskets. This other one would be the, all the lowest price to book stocks, and then it slowly moved up to this out 10. This out 10 would be contains of all the highest price to book ratio stock. And here is a beautiful part of this table. As you can see from the table here, 
the highest price to book ratio stock over the period of uh, 18 years, it returned 6%. As it moved up, the return also moved up together at the same time. And the lowest price to book stock will give us about 14% compounded return for the 18 years period. A $1 will turn into almost $13 between year 1966 and year 1984. How about price to earning ratio? He also did a similar study based on price to earning ratio. He also will rank all the stock on New York Stock Exchange based on 10 basket and put them together from the lowest PE stock to the, to the highest PE ratio stock. And the same result we can see from here. From about 5 over percent, the, in, the return will grow to 14 percent if we were to invest in the lowest basket price to earning stock. A $1 will grow to $12 between 1966 and 1984. What do we see in Asia in the most recent time? 2014, sometime around in September, there's this Occupy Central movement in Hong Kong. We call it um, Yellow Umbrella Revolution. We took the data from S&P Capital IQ and we compiled it. We also did a similar study and ranked all the stock based on price to book ratio, but we grouped them into five baskets. One means all the lowest price to book ratio stock in Hong Kong. And this cover year 2002 to 2016, early of this year. And you also show you the similar pattern. As you move up right, from the highest price to book ratio stock to the lowest basket, you will see the higher compounded return. And bear in mind, between this 14 years period, Hong Kong went through Occupy Central, 2009 Global Financial Crisis, 2003 SARS. I think you have some idea about where this Play is. It's our neighbor, Malaysia. One MDB issue. So, do we find a similar experience in Malaysia as well, not just uh, Hong Kong? This time around, we use the same data, but we use price to earning ratio. Also, we divide all the stock in Malaysia and we group them into five baskets. And we also found a similar pattern. As you move up to the lowest price to earning ratio stock, the return gets better. For the same period of time, 2002 to 2016, Malaysia also been through some political tsunami and SARS and global financial crisis as well. In real life, can we apply the same logic in real life? This is the performance of the fund that we manage, aggregate value fund. The fund since inception on December 2012, we have been able to return 40 over percent until September 2016, three years, nine months. At the same period of time, index only returned about 17%. We have outrun the index by 25%. So what is the next investment principle? Peter Lynch. He is one of the successful fund manager in the recent time. He once said this, far more Money has been lost by investor preparing for corrections or trying to anticipate corrections than has been lost in correction themselves. What was, what was he trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us that we shouldn't try to time the entry into share market. How is that so? In his book, one out on Wall Street, one of the classic investment book, he mentioned that if you have $100,000 and if you invest this $100,000 on July 1994 for five years, fully invested, what will happen to your $100,000? This $100,000 would have grown to $340,000. But what happens if we try to time the entry to the market? We try to go in and out of the market within the five years period. 
what happens if we do that and if we miss out the best 30 performing days in that five-year period, what will happen to our $100,000? It will give us a very dismal performance where this $100,000 will only grow to $150,000. By staying in the market, fully invested, we can double our reward, double our return. Here's another study. Assuming if you have $10,000 to invest from 1993 to 2013, total years, total, uh, total of 20 years period, and invest this $10,000 in S&P 500, what is the performance of this $10,000 for the 20 years period if you fully invested? Here, on the most left-hand side, your $10,000 would have grown to almost $60,000, $58,000, a compounded return of 9.22%. But if we try to time the entry into the market, what would happen to our $10,000 in the 20 years period? If we just miss the 10 best day of the performing days in the 20 years period, our $10,000 will only grow to $29,000. Even worse, if we miss more of it, like 40 days, 50 days, or even 60 days, our $10,000 will have given us a negative result. So, what would be the third principle? Does this look familiar to you? Experts always tell us that we shouldn't put all the eggs into one basket. This is a conventional saying. But can we explore another angle? Can we put our egg in a different types of basket? This is a performance table for the performance of different asset classes between 1994 and 2014. You will see like large international stocks, large US stock, large US value stock, small US value stock, real estate, small stocks, and bonds. And from this table, the top one will be the best performer. Almost every year, it's very hard to tell which will be the asset classes will be the top performer for that year or even the next year. It's really hard to predict that. There's no consistency that you can see from this table. This is an analyzed return table prepared by Professor Iborson as well, and it was published as the Wall Street Journal. And it shows you the return from 1929, January, until 2014. It shows you that for the entire 80 over years period, US small cap stock can return at about 12% per annum. S&P 500, about 9 over percent. Bonds, treasuries, and T-bills will be 6% and below. So let's think about it. If we were to invest our money into many, many different types of assets, what would happen to us? The overall return that we will get from these different types of asset, different classes, it will reduce to 7%. But if we were to invest in equities, we will get a higher result and even double digit result, double digit return. So it makes sense for us to diversify in stock, then diversify into many different asset classes. So what is the summary for the three important lessons. The first one, valuations are the key determinant of the future return. Second, this is equally important or it can be even more important than the first one. Do not time the market. We should instead focus on the time in the market. 
And we should build a diversified portfolio through a number of stocks in equity. It's not to diversify through many different asset classes. It's time to fasten our seat belt, sit tight. There will be some turbulence ahead. So how can we navigate through the sea of accounting frauds, scandals, blows up, and even value traps? This is very important, very, very important. You have to pay attention to this. This may potential, potentially cost us dearly. I have prepared four cases here, a real cases that we can learn and see whether we have a chance to get navigate through all this blowout and scandal. The first one, Sino Forest Corporation. Sometime in June 2011, Muddy Water, a so-called short seller professional, they issue a report on Sino Forest. And since then, the company share price tank and then went into bankruptcy. What happened to this stock? This is a forestry stock from China and they're listed in Canada. It was once a six billion worth of company in Canada. Even a well-known hedge fund manager also reportedly lost about up to 700 million US dollar in this scandal. What happened to this stock before 2011? Between year 2005 to 2010, the revenue for the company has grown from about 500 million US dollar to about 2 billion US dollar. About 3.9 times increase in revenue in five years, a short span of five years. At the same time, if you look at the balance sheet, the timber holding costs increase from 500 million US dollar to 3 billion US dollar, a six time increase in five years. Shareholder equities increased from 468 million dollars, it showed up to 3 billion, a huge add on of six over time in short span of time. This is a very classic. Uh, case of accounting fraud by inflating revenue and its asset. So even before Muddy Water issued the report on 2011 in June, if we look at the financial statement of a company closely, if we do some research and analysis, we will be able to be spared by this scandal. This is the second case. Who is this devil in the photo? He's Ramalinga Raju. He's the founder of this uh, uh, company called Satyam Computer Services. And he's both listed in India and US market. The funny thing about this case is that he himself, Ramalinga, he's the one who blew the whistle. He gave himself the red card. He sent the letter to the board of director and he told the board of director that he cooked up the book. He inflated the cash, debtors, and other assets. It was happened in January 2009. And this case always referred as the Enron of India. So what happened to this company before he blew the whistle? Again, we look at five years before he blew the whistle. What happened? What has happened to this company? Revenue grown from Indian ruby. 22.6 billion to 87 billion, a 3.9 time increase in revenue in five years. So coincident, right? 3.9 times increase in the five years. So, <laughs> and at the same time, because he has to fake the revenue, he also increased the trade receivable from 5 billion to 23 billion, about eight, uh, five times increase in five years. He faked 13,000 of employee and sent 7,500 invoices. PwC, the auditor, is partly to be blamed for this scandal. 
because he faked the cash and they failed to detect it. But can we, as a layman or outsider, are we able to spot this? We can see that the growth in the company is exponential. There is a potentially a chance that we can avoid this scandal. The third one, ABC Learning. It's an Australian stock. After we look at Chinese company, Indian company, how about the Western world? This is a company started by Eddie Groove, the founder. He listed the company in March 2001. At that time, the market cap for the company was $25 million. Five years later, the company share was trading at $2.5 billion. July 2008, two years after March 2006, the company issued a profit warning announcement. And since then, the company has been suspended and went into receivership and investor of the company, they lost great amount of money in the stock. During this period of time, since Eddie listed the company, he has engaged some serious questionable accounting measures during the expansion phase. August 2008, the company got suspended. What happened before 2008? This is the data that I took out from the annual report of a company between year 2002 and 2007. You can see that, right? The number of centers, um, they are the childcare service provider. The number of centers, at first, after they list the company, it was 94. You can see the number of childcare centers has grown tremendously, 24 times in six years. As said, it has grown from 56 million Aussie dollar to 4 billion, 70 times increase. Shareholder equities also the same, 70 times increase. Revenue, 70 times increase. Intangible asset, 70 times increase. So what is this intangible asset? This is an extract from the footnote of the company financial statement. It says like this, the director's valuation of childcare licenses is based on an assessment of their future maintainable earnings. It's so weak. It's so weak such that they can revalue the intangible asset upward to $3 billion. Eddie, he make an almost non-stop stream of aggregation post-listing. The price that he paid for Sanders was not important. The key was to keep growing at all costs. He even acquired his next biggest competitor at all costs. Too fast, too quickly. And his nickname is called Fast Eddie. If you look at the financial statement, we can avoid this scandal. How about this one? This is not, this, the, the fourth one is not about the blow up, the scandal, or the fraud. It's potentially an example of value trap. Who took the cheese, by the way? Excessive executive payout. This is a Hong Kong company. Ticker code is 185 Hong Kong. It has changed name to other names. It's a case of misaligned interest between the majority owner and minority shareholders. What happened to the company? Between financial years of 2005 to financial year 2012, eight years, in total eight years, the total payout to the executive directors was about 300 million Hong Kong dollars. For the same period of time, the profit for the company, it was only 20% of what the executive owner got. It's a huge contrast whereby the payment is excessive and it's all to his himself 
and the family members. And this practice has been dated as far back as even 1998, not just 2005 onwards. And also, sometime in 2010, the major owner of the company also himself, issued himself a huge chunk of options. So that is a classic case of one of the classic case of value traps. So what can we do before when we invest in any companies? What are those things that we should always watch out for? High revenue growth and earnings year after year, which we have seen from the first three cases. High gross profit or net profit might maintain for a very long time, which means it can be unsustainable or they are trying to play some tricks with their book. Non-business nature, one-time gain is a booster to the bottom line of a company. Unexplained increase in other types of asset or non-current asset, like the timber holding costs, like the childcare licenses, those are intangibles. Also, huge related party transactions or dealings, this can be a complex web of um, I would say accounting tricks to hide asset or liabilities. Change of auditors and perhaps few years of negative free cash flow in a row. And another one of the issue will be frequent right issue exercise. One of the company that we came across is this. The company gives us dividend. As an investor, we are very happy to receive dividends. But at the same time, right after dividend, they issue right issue. One hand, they give you money. Another hand, they take money back from you. So these are the things that we should uh, avoid. And there's one more thing that's not uh, mentioned here, written here, is this. Whenever when you come across any company, they are very popular with analysts or fund manager, we should beware. All right. <laughs> so our investor at Aggregate always asks us, what makes us sleep sound at night? Right? So here is the final piece as wise for, for all of us today. We should never invest in a business if we cannot understand them. Right? So I hope today you have gotten some understanding about the investment uh, key principles. And uh, thank you.